Good morning, fellow leaders, and welcome to this session in conversation with the Commissioner of Charities and Charity Council 2023. Now, this session is jointly organized by the Office of the Commissioner of Charities, Charity Council, Pro Bono SG, and the Center for Nonprofit Leadership, NVPC. My name is Kitson, and I am honored to be your moderator for this morning. Please also take note that today's discussion is not intended to substitute any form of professional legal advice. If you require specific legal advice, please consult a lawyer. Now, our panel for today is Mr. Desmond Chin, Commissioner of Charities, Ms. Teresa Goh, Madam Chair of the Charity Council, Mr. Ang Hao Yao, Chairman of the Court Subcommittee and Member of the Charity Council, and joining us online later will be Mr. Gregory Vijayandran, Senior Counsel, Member of Charity Council and Chairman of Pro Bono SG. Thank you for joining us this morning. This year, we are happy to have once again a hybrid session. Some of you have joined us last year as well. Now, we have representatives from the various charities with us this morning right here in Suntec, as well as some of us are watching live over Zoom. For today's program, we will first have an opening address by the Commissioner of Charities, Mr. Desmond Chin. It will be followed by a sharing on the revised Code of Governance, followed by a panel discussion and wrapping up with a Q&A session. Without further ado, I would like to invite Commissioner of Charities, Mr. Desmond Chin, to give us the opening address. COC, please. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be with you this morning. Um, to those who have joined us at Suntech, it has been wonderful to be able to meet up and catch up with old friends and to speak to you in person this morning. Last year, we had a hybrid session as well at NBPC, but there was only 25 people standing in front of me. Today, there are about, I think, about 600 of you, plus another eight or 900 or so who, are, uh, who have linked in during, during, uh, through the Zoom session. So I'd like to welcome all of you, those who are present here, as well as those who are linking in with us through the Zoom session. So welcome, everyone. Let me first thank Pro Bono Singapore and the Centre for Nonprofit Leadership for co-organising this hybrid event. We have worked with both for several years now, and they have been nothing short of excellent. I would like to especially thank Gregory, who is somewhere in Australia, Hongi, Tony, Kitson and their teams for their professionalism and their unwavering support all the time. It's been a pleasure working with all of you. I would also like to especially thank Teresa, Hao Yao, Gregory and Kitson in advance for being on the panel uh, when we have that session later. It will not be so lonely for me then. At this point, of reg at the point of registration, the organizers had asked all the registrants what they were interested to know from this session, as well as any questions they might want to ask in advance. We collected over 80, 80 questions, 83 to be precise. So thank you for those questions. I hope we'll be able to answer them. Now, some of the questions were very technical in nature. For example, they asked, some of you have asked, the need for board term limits. Other questions were more philosophical. For instance, someone asked, what should the charity look like in the near future? But the one question that really caused me to fall over my chair was this. Somebody asked, who is responsible for checking the president? <laughs> I'm not sure if the registrant had signed up for the correct forum, but I really hope that there is a constitutional lawyer among us because he's going to take that question. He or she will take that question because I don't know what the answer is. Our panelists will try to answer all the questions and any others that you might have later on. Finally, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the eight charity council that was so ably led by Dr. Gerard E 
for the effort and guidance to all of us over the past term. As they pass the, the baton, let us welcome the ninth Charity Council that is led by Ms. Teresa Goh. My office and the Charity Council will continue to work closely together to guide and to support all our charities towards good governance and success. In the course of my work, I have come across some charities who ask me, why is there a need for good governance, especially when they are already doing well? If you are in a business, your shareholders will expect you to act in the best interest of the company, to be accountable, to be transparent, and to abide by the rule of law. In other words, good governance is what your shareholders expect and demand of you to exercise and to enforce. It is no different when it comes to charities. Your donors, your volunteers, your sponsors, your grant makers, and the public expect and demand that you run a tight ship and exercise good governance in everything that you do. And in some ways, I think the expectations of charities can be even higher where good governance is concerned because you are receiving public donations that are meant for the use and the benefit of your beneficiaries. And this also includes the religious groups. Therefore, good governance is the foundation stone upon which all charities must sit on. Practically, good governance requires charities to be familiar with your fiduciary duties as spelled out in the Charity Act and its related legislation. To have in place the right processes and procedures in running your charity. For example, your procurement procedures, your HR policies, your anti-money laundering policies, and terrorism financing policies. I think the, the public will also expect you to run your charity with maximum effectiveness and with minimum waste, and that's why we have the 3070 rule in place. The Code of Governance is also an important document to guide you on this. The last time the Code was revised was in 2017, almost six years ago. We decided uh, last year that we should revise it to ensure that it continues to remain relevant for our charities. So in 2022, Mr. Ang Hao Yao led a 12-member Code Subcommittee to review the existing Code. A public consultation exercise was held in May and June last year, we also had four focus group discussions where 134 charities' feedback across all sectors were received, and this feedback has been incorporated largely into the code. The revised code has basically moved from prescriptive mode to one that is principle-based. It has also been simplified. Caris, one of our colleagues, will take us through the key changes shortly after this, and we can take any clarifications at the panel discussions as well. The revised code will then be made public via the charity portal later today at 4 p.m. I thought I'll share a little bit and take this time, since all of us are here, to share a bit of the observations that um, I have had after spending about two and a half years in the charity sector. I came into this job in October 2020, uh, during, in the midst of COVID-19. I've seen all of you having a very, very tough three years. We have now come out of COVID-19 not too long ago, but I'm, and I'm glad to see that many of you have resumed your charitable activities in full. I'm now into my third year as the Commissioner of Charities, and as I told some of you, because you asked me what, what, how the journey has been, well, it's been an exhilarating ride. I visited quite a few charities over this period. Many, many are doing excellent and inspirational work, so thank you for that. But I've also had my fair share of difficult cases, including some recalcitrant ones that I will have. Well, some recalcitrant ones that I think sometimes they ought to be behind bars. Fortunately, this group is a minority, so I'm very thankful for that. But they must not be allowed to sully the good name of the vast majority of you who do good work and who continue to serve your beneficiaries. We must not allow the few to sully the majority. Now, if I may, I would like to share three quick observations of the charity sector and what we might expect moving forward. With a changing population profile in Singapore, 
speedy access to information and the influence of social media. I think that donors and the public will, increasing, will be increasingly discerning as to who they want to donate to, they will be increasingly discerning to whom they want to volunteer with, and even how your charity ought to be run, whether they are members or not. The demands and the expectations of your charities is not just for you to do good, but for you to do good well, if not very well. Now, to me, doing well does not mean being successful. In my view, doing well means being effective. It will no longer be about output, but it will be about outcomes and about impact. It will not be about the quantity of work you do, but the quality of the work that you deliver. Funders and grant makers I've seen are increasingly measuring you against these. They will give you grants, no doubt, if you can demonstrate how the work you do impacts not just one life, but creates an expanding ripple effect of change that positively influences the lives of others and society as a whole. If you have not done so, I think it will be crucial that our charities start to think along these lines and to start to refine the way in which you plan and deliver results. Secondly, the best-run charities I've seen I visited are those whose board and management teams are always guided by their vision and aligned in their mission. An effective board provides clear policy directions for the management team. It is future-oriented. It constantly scans the horizon for both challenges as well as opportunities. It always builds capacities and capabilities in time for the future. In other words, it is proactive, it does not wait for a disaster to come upon it, it plans to overcome that disaster. A wise board also does not overreach, it is almost obsessive in its succession planning efforts because it knows the charity will need new ideas and energy that only a refreshed team with a fresh pair of legs can bring to their charity. Now, an effective management team, on the other hand, is one that is totally mission-focused. It gets things done. When faced with obstacles, it does not moan and groan. It makes course adjustments if necessary, and it gets on with the task. It values and manages its volunteers well, as I've seen in some charities. They do not treat their volunteers as an extra pair of hands or an added workforce. They treat their volunteers as a team. That's how it is with good management teams. Effective charities are therefore those whose board and their management team make good governance the cornerstone of their practice. And this is what we are talking about today with the revised code. Good management teams and good boards understand the value of transparency and the need for accountability to all their stakeholders and their shareholders. Practically, what this means is that they must submit their mandatory annual submissions on time and all the time. These mandatory submissions include your financial statements, your governance evaluation checklist, and your annual reports. I am troubled that about 40% of our charities have not submitted their mandatory annual submissions. We are now in the midst of finding out who these are and why they have not done so. And action will have to be taken soon, I'm afraid. So I would really, really appreciate and ask all of you who are here, whether by Zoom or physically, if you could remind those whom you know who have not submitted their annual mandatory submissions to do so quickly while there's still time. Then the COC's office will not have to invite them down to MCCY for coffee because there's only so much coffee we can drink. Now, thirdly, COVID-19 may be over, but the next disaster will come. It is not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. So effective charities must understand that it cannot be business as usual anymore. They must learn the hard lessons of COVID-19 and retune their operations to withstand the next shock. May I suggest three areas that I think will be useful for charities to look at in this regard. COVID-19, firstly, COVID-19 had thrown us into all sorts of turmoil. Charities could not run your usual programs and services the way you're used to physically. Almost all of us had to pivot to a virtual mode. 
and those who could not make this change suffered terribly. I think it would have been even worse um, if the government had not stepped in. So I think it is now useful to start to review all your programs and services to determine how they should be run in different modes, via different means, and through different modalities to minimize disruptions for the good work you do should the next COVID-19 come by. Secondly, we should take this opportunity now to exploit technology, not just in delivering your services and your programs, but to streamline and to, simpl and to simplify all your work processes, to communicate more effectively with your stakeholders and to safeguard your sensitive data. You do not want the data you have to spill into the public realm and cause you great reputational damage. If the, our charities here are not very sure how to go about doing this, then may I suggest that there is all sorts of grants under the Charities Capability Fund that you can tap on, including those for digitalization and for the use of technology. Please make use of these funds. We went to great lengths to get these funds from Tote Board and MOF, who has kindly given us that money for you. to Use that fund for your charity, please. Lastly, if there's anything that we can take away from COVID-19 that I've seen, is that the pandemic had taught our charities not to rely on a single source of funding. Many would have failed if the government had not provided some help along the way. But moving forward, I think charities need to try and build a more diversified portfolio of funding sources. Please do not rely just on grants. Grants come with conditions. Secondly, do not fundraise based only on one signature event. You run the risk of uh, running into all sorts of operations and shortfalls if you do that. And also, please, don't depend on a single funder to pay for the bulk of your operations. Funders may wake up one day, get off the bed and decide to fund your under charity and not you. Now, ideally, charities also need to build up your reserves as well so that you can weather a prolonged storm while continuing to run your daily operations. Now, many of you have joined the charity sector because you want to make a difference in the lives of our fellow Singaporeans. This is commendable, and thank you for that. In doing good, we have said that we must also do well. In doing well, it means you must be effective. And being effective means that you must have a board and a management team that is vision-centered and that is mission-aligned. It means that the lessons of COVID-19 has not been lost on us and that we are now putting in place business continuity plans for the long-term sustainability of our charities. It also means diversifying our funding sources and not relying on an individual source of income. It means exploiting technology and digitalization now to run all our operations better. And it also means moving from output to outcome and impact-based management uh, measurements. Lastly, and most of all, it means making good governance a daily habit that all of us adhere to. Thank you for being with us today. It is wonderful to see all of you here, whether physically or virtually. Let's continue to work together to build a strong foundation of good governance in all our charities so that our sector can continue to thrive and to make our society an even better one for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Now, fellow leaders, we will now have a sharing on the revised Code of Governance uh, by colleagues from our Charity Council Secretariat. Harris, over to you, please. Good morning to all charities here with us at Suntech and welcome to charities watching online. I'm Carries from MCCY Charities Unit and I'll be sharing with you on the revised Code of Governance today. Now today we will be focusing on three main areas. First, we will recap on what our Code of Governance is and then I will highlight on the key revisions that we have made for our revised code. And lastly, we will share with you the resources available for you to implement our code. 
So now let us refresh what is our code of governance. So our first code was launched in 2007, and it has been 16 years, and we have did uh, two refinements over the, two, uh, over the 16 years. And in 2021, we actually did a revision led by a 12-member subcommittee, led by uh, Haoyao, and then it's, they are appointed by our eight charity council. So we are honored that today we will be officially issuing this code of governance 2023. So a robust code will raise the standards of governance in the charity sector and instill confidence in Singaporeans to give and support our charities and your causes. So the code continues to operate on a comply or explain um, principles and charities are encouraged to review and considering, uh, consider amending your governing instruments, bylaws, policies, so that you can be aligned to this code and act on the best interest of your charity. We would also like to highlight that the reporting requirements of this revised code will apply to your charity's financial year beginning on or after 1st January 2024. Now, so why do we need the code? So this is to make charities more effective by sharing recommended best practices for good governance. And it's also to help our board members to provide guidance for them because they are representatives entrusted to act in the best interest of your charities. And lastly, to boost our public confidence in the charity sector by setting the standards of good governance for charities to aspire and work towards. Now, the code will continue to be a practical tool for charities to achieve good governance and for the member of the public to understand what good governance is and to make informed decision into which charities to support. Now, let us share the key revisions made to the revised code. So, we are moving towards a principles-based code with clearer guidelines to strengthen the governance practices of charities in Singapore. So this is to encourage our charities to, be, to take a more active role in reviewing and assessing whether your operations are actually in line with our principles instead of viewing this code as a box-ticking exercise. Uh, so these are the six principles listed over here. So principle one, the charity serves its mission and achieves its objectives. So this is meant to be answering to questions as to why do your charity exist and who do you serve? Principle two, the charity has an effective board and management. This is to focus on guiding your charity to having a competent board and management that can work well together. Principle three, the charity acts responsibly, fairly, and with integrity. So this aims to guide your charity to think and act in the best interest of your charity. Principle four, the charity is well managed and plans for the future. So this helps your charities to think about um, and act like what to do on your policy so that you can propel forward in the next decades. Principle five, the charity is accountable and transparent. So this is to highlight that uh, we need to be compliant. So we need to comply with all the necessary charity act regulations and be transparent in your work. And principle six, the charity communicates actively to instill public confidence. This is to highlight the need to engage your stakeholders actively to build strong relationships together and to build positive relationships with the media and public as well. Now, the revised code sets out six principles and we do share the rationale of why each principle are as such. And then we will follow by the relevant guidelines, which we call them call for action. So examples are also provided so that charities will understand what you can do, what you cannot do, and how, that, how to apply all these principles effectively and accurately in your work. Now, this is a table that charities are very familiar with, for the, or we have been using it for the past five years. So basically, this is where you are in terms of your tiering. So for non-IPCs, you are all categorized into basic, intermediate, enhanced tiers, and for IPCs, you are categorized into intermediate, enhanced, and advanced tiers. So now with the revised code, we have reduced it from four tiers to two tiers. So tier one is meant for small and medium non-IPC charities, meaning that your financial size is about 50, from $50,000 to $10 million. So all of you are in tier one. 
And for tier two, they are for all IPCs and large non-IPCs, are, you are all in tier two. All right, so this is a step taken to bring charities to a higher level of governance. So tier one charities, you will be subjected to a standard set of guidelines under each principle. And tier two charities, you will be subjected to additional guidelines under each principle because IPCs must be held to a higher standard of accountability as you enjoy the benefits of having the IPC status. So large non-IPC charities should also have sufficient resources to put in place the necessary measures to comply with the revised code. So now let me illustrate which tier you will be in. So if let's say you are a non-IPC and you are currently in basic and intermediate tier, you will be in tier one. And if you are currently in the enhanced tier, you are in tier two. And for all IPCs in intermediate, enhanced and advanced tiers, you will all be in tier two. Now, so in terms of trying to submit your FYGC, so taking this illustration for submitting FY24GC in the year of 2025, how do you know which tier you are in and what do you, how do you, or which tier do you submit? And especially if your size crossed the $10 million mark. So referring to this table, in FY23 and 24, we will look at the amount that is lower in the two FY. So for example, if a non-IPC has a $10 million in FY23 and a $9.9 .9 million in FY24, you will still be in tier one when submitting your FY24 GEC in the year of 2025. And if the non-IPC has $10 million in both FY, you will be submitting in tier two. So for tier two IPC charities, regardless of the amount, you will still be in tier two. Okay, as we mentioned about the submission of GC, which is short for your governance evaluation checklist, we would like to recap the guidelines of GC. So while the code operates on the basis of comply and explain, it is a legislative requirement to submit the GEC and charities that do not submit your GEC are liable to pay a composition sums. So the Office of COC and your sector administrators will issue warnings and penalties if found out that charities have willfully disregarded these requirements. So before the submission of GEC via your charity portal, it is, it is important to get it approved by your charity board and management. All right, so charities are encouraged to go through the GEC during the meeting so that a minute down the approval by both board and management. Now, GEC is also available on our charity portal, meaning that the public can actually view your GEC, read and find out more about your charity. So it is important to get it approved and submit your GEC via our charity portal. Next. During the public consultation in May, we have proposed a scoring matrix that actually created quite a response from our charities, and we hear you. So that's why this scoring matrix is no longer a point deduction system. So meaning uh, it will be a point allocation system, meaning that instead of deducting points for non-compliance items, each response to the GEC guidelines will be allocated a point. So if you comply with the GEC item, you will be awarded two points. If you did not uh, comply to the item, you will be awarded with zero points. Yeah, so in addition, the council understands that there are charities face some challenges, and sometimes you may need more time to comply with certain guidelines due to limited resources, and possibly because uh, you have some constraints to achieve the full compliances during that year. So. Uh, we also receive uh, feedback from charities that it's actually quite inaccurate for them to take, apply or say that they did not apply because they are working towards it. So because of this, we have included this option called a partial compliance. So this partial compliance will be awarded with one point. So charities who have been putting effort to full comply with the guideline code but still unable to fully uh, comply yet, you can choose this option of partial compliance you have to input your uh, reasons for not uh, uh, fully complying to the code yet. And tell us the steps that you are doing to achieve the full compliance. All right, so with this, you will be awarded one point. 
Now, given the diversity of our charity sector and feedback from charities, the Council recognises that the unique circumstances faced by each charity and understand that it might not be possible for charities to adopt 100% of the code guidelines at the point of submission. So compliance of at least 80% of the guidelines is, an good, is a good indication that most of the key recommended governance practices are actually adopted and implemented by a charity. Yeah, so with the revised code, IPCs are expected to achieve 100%, if not at least 95% compliance as they are held to the higher standards of accountability. All right, so IPC with GEC scores of 80% or 95% will be considered favorably when you submit your IPC application for assessment. Uh, however, please note that there are also other considerations when we are assessing your uh, IPC status for application or extension. All right, this includes compliance with the Charity Act and any other regulation made under the Act. So the first batch of charities to submit the revised GEC will be those with financial year ending on 31st December 2024, meaning that your submission will be by June 2025. Now, this shows the number of GEC items per principle. And to note that Tier 1 charities, you will have a total of 30 GEC items. And for Tier 2 charities, you will have a total of 38 GEC items. Next, zooming in to some of the guidelines, so we have here ESG, short for Environmental, Social and Governance. This ESG matters to all organisations, sectors and industries that are interlinked together. Over the recent years, ESG has gained greater importance among investors, policy makers and other key stakeholders because they are viewed as a safeguard against our future risks. So we are introducing this ESG concept into this revised code. So charities are encouraged to keep your activities environmentally friendly and sustainable. So for example, you can take into the Singapore Green Plan 2030 for reference and incorporate all the green practices in your charity. And in terms of social, we, we encourage charities to maintain good relationship with your stakeholders. For example, showing care and concern for your staff, donors, board members, partners, and so on. And for governors, of course, to maintain high governance standards, which is to comply with all the applicable re regulations, our charity act, our code, our charity transparency frameworks, and so on. All right? So as such, under principle three, guideline 3.5, states that charities should take into consideration the ESG factors when conducting the charity's activity. So there are several ways to comply with this guideline. So you can consider going digital when conducting your fundraising, or showing appreciation to your stakeholders regularly, and referencing to our charity transparency, transparency framework when you are drafting your annual report. All right, so all these are examples of how you can comply with this guideline. So what if your charity is not equipped to implement ESG to your charity work? So we will be collaborating with various partners to develop relevant ESG guide and templates and of course to conduct trainings for our charities to raise your understanding of ESG and to guide you on the steps to incorporate these ESG factors in your programs. Your charity will be regarded as complying with the guideline as long as you indicate in your annual report or any other documents or your other platforms that you have considered the ESG factors when conducting your activities. Now, next to the term limits guideline. So another key revision made is the update to this guideline that is found in the current code 2017. So charities under the enhanced and advanced years, the guideline recommends charities to set your term limits for your board members and to disclose reasons for retaining these board members who have served on the board for more than 10 consecutive years. So now the change is, the new guideline now requires Tier 2 charities to impose a maximum limit of 10 consecutive years. We have retained the guideline that allows reappointment to the board, which can be considered after at least a two-year break. And charities should continue to disclose reasons for retaining board members 
who have served on the board for more than 10 con consecutive years. So the council says that this is a timely time to do this revision, given that the sector has been prepared for this in the current code. So in addition, the council is providing the flexibility via a re-election should your charity have very strong reasons to retain a board members beyond 10 years. We encourage charity to have appropriate succession planning and steady renewal of your board. Now, let us illustrate this guideline. So for compliance with the guidelines, your board member should step down after serving 10 years. So if let's say after two years, your charity decides, okay, it's time to invite this board member, a former board member back to serve on the board, you can do so by reappointing this former board member. And then his or her board term will restart from year one. So in a case where a board member stepped down for less than two years, so in this example B, the board member serves for four years, stepped down for one year, and was reappointed again after that, he or she will continue his board term, which will be from the fifth year. So lastly, if your charity have very strong reasons to retain your board members beyond the 10 years, you can do so by conducting an election. All right, so if the board member is re-elected, he or she will serve for another term. So in some cases, some charities will be two-year term, three-year term. And then thereafter, if he or she uh, is re-elected again, should your charity think that, okay, there's a very strong need to retain this, this person, this board member, you can do so. Okay, so we have received feedback from smaller IPCs that it's very difficult to find board members. So the code still operates on a comply or explain approach. So if you have difficulty applying to this uh, guideline, please explain in your GEC and a report and other documents. And because of the additional flexibility of the re-election, charity, if you decide that it's necessary to retain that particular board member, you can do so through the re-election. So it is very important to disclose your succession plan in your annual report and GEC as well. Now, there are some other minor revisions that we have made to the code as well. So they are, instead of having at least one third of your board members during the meetings, the quorum now has increased to at least half of the board. So this is to ensure that there are sufficient representation uh, of your board when making important decisions during your board meetings. And instead of recording just proceeding and decision of your board, uh, board meetings, descending views should be minute down as well. So this will help the person reading the minutes to understand the key discussion point before making any conclusion. And throughout the current code in 2017, charities have been uh, setting internal policies in various areas and reviewing them on a regular basis. So the revised code now requires it to include two additional areas, and they are your anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism, and information technology, which is your IT, which includes uh, data pr uh, privacy management, cyber security, data protection, and so on. Now, lastly, the revised code also encourages charities to implement a media communication policy to help the board and management to build positive relationships with the media and the public. So this is to assist charities in communicating the right messages to the media and the public. Okay, now charities, you are not alone in this journey to achieving good governance. The Office of COC and Charity Council are here to support you. We will be conducting various training uh, sessions to raise charities' awareness of these key revisions to the revised code, as well as to provide guidance and help in the implementation process and to address any queries that you have on the application of this revised code. In addition, the Office of COC has assisting guides and templates on topics such as board committees, terms of reference, conflict of interest, internal controls, uh, shared has resources, on the Charity Portal website. So charities can take reference from these guides and templates, and while being mindful to understand the principles behind these guides and templates, uh, you can actually make the necessary customization to your charities to best suit the needs. 
Charities can also tap on our Charities Capability Fund, CCF, to prepare yourself for the implementation of the revised code and guidelines. So should you require an external consultant to advise on governance matter, you can also reach out to our shared services partners who are providing pro bono consultancy uh, clinics for you. And over the past two years, we have been organizing various webinars on very helpful topics for charities. So if you have missed this webinar, don't, be, don't worry, these recordings are available on our charity portal as well. So feel free to watch them, share with your staff, management, uh, board members as well. Now, before I end this sharing, we would like to remind charities to submit your annual report, financial statements, and GEC via the charity portal before your charity's due date which is within six months from your financial year end. Okay, if you have difficulty submitting this report, please reach out to us or your uh, sector administrators. All right, we will be very happy to assist you. Now, without further any delay, let's take out our mobile phone and scan this QR code to download the revised Code of Governance. So in summary, please try to understand, apply the code, aim for 100%, if not 95%, of uh, complying with the code and please know that the effective date of this revised code is for FY beginning or on or after 1st January 2024. That means now you are still referring to the current code 2017. Only after 1st January 2024, we will be referring to this revised code. All right. And always remember to submit your AR, FS, GEC within six months from your financial year end. All right, if you have any queries, please feel free to reach out to us. We will be happy to help you, to guide you along the way. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Karis, for the sharing. Well, I hope all of us found the presentation informative, as well as the reminder she gave us just before stepping off. Well, the revised code will certainly help us in improving our governance, policies, and practices. We shall now invite our panelists on stage for the panel discussion. We have with us this morning, Commissioner of Charities, Mr. Desmond Chin. Madam Chair of Charity Council, Ms. Teresa Go, Chairman of Code of Subcommittee, Mr. Ang Hao Yao, a member of the Charity Council, and joining us online from Australia, Mr. Gregory Vijayarajan, Senior Council, Member of Charity Council and Chairman of Pro Bono SG. Well, to kick off the panel discussion for this morning, may I first channel the, the question to Hao Yao because how you understand you are the chair of the court subcommittee. I wanted to seek your views on how this revised code can help charities boost public confidence and more importantly, to attain the long-term sustainable, um, sustainability compared to the earlier code. Well, as you heard, the new code is principle-based so that charities can be guided in terms of the principles behind the call to actions and the governance evaluation checklist. As the code is grouped into six principles, which corresponds to the major areas in running a charity. Generally, the first is mission, and then board and management, responsibility, and along with that, ESG, future focus, accountability, and lastly, communication. I would hope that charities can internalize these principles and perhaps even adopt them as their own. They can use these principles in their communications when they reach out to their stakeholders, as well as to build a culture of governance for long-term sustainable success. The new item on environment, for example, is for charities to think more about the impact they have on the environment. I'm sure charities are already doing a lot of good things for the environment, and there's no reason not to share them with your stakeholders, not just the actions, but the objectives behind their actions, what you feel is important, and what your plans are. This will boost public confidence in the organization. 
Another new item I would like to highlight is the 10-year term limit, which is intended to encourage the grooming of a new generation of leaders in the organization for long-term sustainability. Thank you, Hayao. Now, on, on this topic of public confidence, yeah, how, how do you think the public is aware of this code and you know, how, how, how do charities actually demonstrate this? Or maybe Teresa or Commissioner like to add on to this? Well, I hope that it's not just uh, something that's promulgated by us, but that charities really uh, take, take it down to their board, to their, uh, even their staff, their beneficiaries, you know, and, and to demonstrate that they have a culture of governance that will help us with the outreach as well. Right, thank you. So you, you mentioned also the culture of governance. And, and well, from a new lens, uh, Teresa, you are the new Madam Chair for Charity Council. And uh, since how you talk about the culture of the governance, from your lens, you know, um, how do you define a thriving charity sector? What would you think you will work on first? Well, thank you, Kitson, for the question. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to do a sound check because I couldn't really hear how Yao. How many of you cannot hear me clearly at all? Hands up, please. Okay, good. So you can hear me clearly. Uh, well, to answer your question, uh, Kitson, on what uh, a thriving charity sector looks like, I will probably need an hour, but I'm going to summarize my response. I think a sector that's thriving should earn a high level of public trust. And to demonstrate the public trust, there should be tangible public support and engagement. A thriving charity sector should also be diversified, meaning we are catering to a broad spectrum of needs. It must also be inclusive, meaning special effort must be made to ensure that those who are needy and invisible, especially those without a voice, are being looked after. Now, what are the implications for the charities then? We are looking for charities to have a clear idea of what is the impact that you bring to your communities. And you must be able to measure that impact. We are also looking for charities to be financially strong and sustainable. Charities must also be effectively delivering on your services and products, if any. And most importantly, charities must be prepared for the future, because the future is so uncertain. I hope I've summarized it, yeah? And if you look at the Code of Governance, it gives you the entire entire suite of principles and guidelines to follow in order for you to support a, strive, a thriving charity sector. Thank you, Teresa. You mentioned this topic on the measurement of impact. Mm -hmm. And I also understand that in the revised code, there is a need to, to measure this impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how does this look like? Because what happens today is that most of our charities, we typically measure just to meet the request of our funders. Mm -hmm. You know, typically it's to obtain grants or sponsorships. Yeah. Right. Now, many of you who know systems theory would be familiar with the concept of output outcomes and impact. If Kitson is asking about whether uh, charities writing impact papers to donors, is this a good thing? I think if you're able to position impact to donors, it's a good start. You know, it means that you're not looking at output and outcomes alone, but also impact. Because impact goes upstream, yeah, and impact is holistic. Impact looks at the life cycle of your beneficiary and not just what he or she gets at the end of the program. So that's a good start. But your paper must be honest, yeah. Don't just highlight your strengths and your success. You must also highlight the challenges and the risk. Yeah, because in doing so, your donors will trust you more, your paper has more integrity. Now, my concern about papers just being written for donors is that programs are some, sometimes very short-lived. Yeah, there, there's a certain period of delivery and there's some output uh, and maybe even outcomes uh, at the end of it. 
is this enough? If you keep doing program papers just for donors, you might be denying yourself the opportunity to think upstream. Yeah? What else can we do other than the programs? How does this program link to other programs which may not be delivered by your charity but by other charities? So what is that collab collaborative synergistic outcomes that can happen as you go upstream? And going upstream is not just an intention. You do need new skills, right? You need systems thinking skills, design thinking skills. You need to understand the ecosystems to a very large extent, as well as really understand the ground data. So writing programs for donors is the start, Kitson, but that shouldn't be the be all and end all. Well, you also mentioned a fair bit of skills, and I like the part that you mentioned about, you know, being honest in your paper, the integrity, and the risk. Well, I believe Gregory will have a lot to say about this, you know, from the legal side. Gregory, maybe over to you. We haven't heard from you. If I could just, um, you know, uh, compliment uh, what Teresa has shared with us. Um, I think um, this sort of upstream thinking, you know, taking a step back, asking, you know, a priori questions such as, you know, who and why? You know, who do you serve? Why do you exist? And, and allowing that to essentially shape the fundamental and the foundational thinking. Uh, charities have to remember that um, it is integral to their identity that, you know, they are carrying out exclusively charitable purposes. And that means you've got to safeguard against, um, you know, mission creep. You've got to safeguard against, uh, you know, losing that charitable identity. Uh, measuring uh, impact is not easy. I think we are, you know, used to the idea of measuring output, uh, perhaps even outcomes, but, you know, impact measurement, impact evaluation is, is critical in terms of how much difference is being made uh, to the sector. It may be complex, it may require collaboration, it may require an evidence-based approach, uh, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a way of thinking. And so, uh, you know, while the, the points made by, um, you know, Teresa, I completely agree with them. I mean, you know, you, you have to work intelligently and honestly with your, with your donors and your benefactors, but, um, you know, it's got to go beyond writing papers. It's got to really be about fostering an internal way of thinking in the charity and specifically at the board and management level. Thank you so much, Gregory. Now, talking about the board and management, I, I, I mean, that, that's, and, and there's quite a lot of a talk recently about the competencies of our board members and the management team. And I believe one of the uh, new requirements is uh, board members and management team to undergo training where necessary. Now, one of the common feedback that we often get is that our board members and our directors are accomplished individuals. They are well known and often they are very busy. There's no time to attend training sessions, you know. Anyway, they should already know their, their roles and responsibilities. Isn't that right, Gregory? Yeah, since, since you are already online. Yeah. Well, you're never too learner to learn. And uh, all of us, you know, can, can constantly learn. It's not just about, you know, the kind of experience and the expertise you have serving in the sector or serving on various boards, but it's really about understanding the culture, the nuances, uh, the other uh, aspects that are bespoke to that charity board that you're serving on. And so in terms of process, uh, the induction is still key. The form and structure may vary, and sometimes it may need to be, you know, uh, accelerated. You could use Zoom, uh, you know, but it's about really being introduced to that culture, the nuances, uh, and also how your portable skills that you have uh, as an experienced and expert board member, uh, albeit with limited bandwidth in some occasions, uh, can be applied to this new context. Um, we go back again to a very clear fundamental. The most important resource of a charity is the human capital. And that includes the board, the management, and the staff. And um, it's very important that skills and governance principles may be portable, but they are not operable in vacuum. Uh, also, to give this some degree of balance, it is really about what is necessary, training that is necessary. 
And so we're really speaking about specific training for the individual board member who may be overseeing, say, for example, finance, HR, IT, media relations, and so on, but also generalized uh, you know, board skills um, that uh, may be necessary. Thank you. I, I, I wanted to lend a perspective as well. Um, Socrates say an unexamined mind is not worth living. Yeah, and he's not insulting anybody. He's just stressing on the need for people, people in general, to have continuous learning. If people need to have continuous learning, then what is the onus on board members? I mean, you are a governing council, and even if you're a leader in the sector, you have the responsibility to ensure that your charity is effective. So learning is a non-compromise. It's not, it's, it's not a choice, really. I volunteered with this sector 15 years ago with the setup of the Centre for Nonprofit Leadership, and that was to offer training for boards and leaders. Over the years, you could say that I'm seeing the same faces coming for the training. Yeah, and I kept wondering why, what happened to the invisible directors? So I started talking to them and they say, no, I have no time, there's no need. I know everything already. That is a dangerous position to be, yeah? Um, why? Why? Because especially with the pandemic, the world has changed tremendously. And with geopolitics, Industry 4.0, uh, with the uh, digitization, artificial intelligence, and with the call for diversity, and so many other things that's happening around the world, the business cycle, even for the large businesses, has been reduced to about 20 years. Yeah, so this is not me talking. You talk to the economists, they will tell you that the life cycle of businesses have been reduced to about 20 years because it takes a much shorter time for competition to rise in the entire uh, economics of society. Now, if our donors are facing such a short-term life cycle, what do you think of charities? Do you think you can really sit back and ensure that the funders are continue to fund you? They are going to be very, very selective in where their money goes to. The other thing I wanted to highlight is training has gone through such a transformation. For those of you who used to attend training where you sit down, the instructor rambles on and share information, it's no longer the case. You can now assess training anytime from anywhere. There's online training, there's hybrid, there's cross learning, there's networking learning. There are so many ways of learning. So directors, I encourage you, no more excuse, yeah? Please, please pick the form of training that meets your needs and be there, appear, learn from others. And I'm sure all of you have some gems to share with others as well. That's the kind of training we are looking for. And at this point in time, we are stringing together all the training partners together across the sectors as well, because I believe there's a lot of training that can be co-shared across the sector. Of course, some of that will be niche according to your sectors. But what we're trying to do is to consolidate, streamline and align all our training partners across the sectors. And we will be able to create a menu of a menu of you know, training that fits your needs. And I'm particularly interested in life cycle of directors, of leaders. And when I mean leaders, I'm not talking just about people on the board and top management. I'm talking also about middle management and the workforce in general. Yeah, all of you are leaders in your own right, with or without the power and the title. So you can see I'm very passionate about this. Yes, we can see that, Teresa. <laughs> yes, I believe Haoyang has something to chime in. Yeah. Yes, of course, I agree that you know, directors should attend structured training. But I think as outside of structured training, you can also get mentoring, coaching you know, from either the chair or even members uh, from outside the charity who are experienced board directors to come in and give you know, tips and guidances for young boards you know, who are not very experienced or who are unable to navigate all the code and all the governance requirements. Yeah, so I think we should make use of the other people in the sector as well to, to help out. Yeah, very true, Hayao. And in fact, this brings us to a next question that is um, one of the hot questions. And you mentioned, Hayao, as well, there's training, there's uh, you know, mentoring, there's uh, coaching, but you know, we still have this issue that, well, we have the term limit of 10 consecutive years, 
You know, these members are important to us. We need to have them on the board. They have their rich experiences. We can't lose them. Yeah, so what are your views on that, Commissioner, since yeah, this I'm, came from you? Sorry, can you all hear me? <laughs> if you can't, please raise your hand. I, I'm trying to look at the 81 votes. I realize that my, <laughs> I can't see very clearly. <laughs> it's, it's, on the team, it's on the term limit. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a hot question. This, this is what happens when you reach 58 years old. <laughs> so I, I, I can understand uh, uh, that when you're comfortable with a board and a team that you, you've been working with for a long time and you're comfortable with, change is very difficult. We, we have said that the board term limit is for 10 years. Uh, ideally, you should make a switch and you should use your time. And I think I use the word effective boards uh, are almost obsessive uh, in planning for their succession planning. For those cases, we would like to see that the majority of the charities do make that effort to start to think about their future. I, I find it hard to imagine that a person, that your charity can continue to run as effectively after 10 years if everybody stays on for eternity. I, I think there will not be fresh ideas uh, and all you do, you make very incremental changes and you will not be uh, making the changes that are significant that is needed for the charity. So I, I think you should start to plan for that. Somebody asked me, will it be, it's, it's, a, it's a comply or explain, uh, not comply and explain, it's comply <laughs> or explain. So for some reason, if you think that you really need that person, that individual to you there, then, then explain it. And if your reasons are fine, good. Look, the judge of it, the judge of this is not going to be the Commissioner of Charities Office. The judge of it in time to come will be the public and your donors. Why do I say that? Remember I earlier, both Keris and myself had, had mentioned about this mandatory um, annual submissions, which include your financial statements, your GEC, and so on and so forth. As the regulator, as the charity or commissioner's office, it is our job to make sure that the public uh, knows who they're giving to and that they're giving to a trusted charity and they're giving it and they know that the money is going to the right place. It will come a day where we will have to encourage the public to make sure that you look at the charity's website and that they have submitted the annual submissions they will have submitted their GEC compliance and they will also have submitted all sorts of mandatory requirements so that the public and your donors and the volunteers can make an informed choice whether or not they are going to uh, contribute to your charity in one way or another. I think it will come and it will come between 5 to 10 years from now. Our public is getting more and more discerning. Uh, people know, that they want, know what they want out of charities, know what they want to do with their lives. So I think we need to make sure that we move out of that. Uh, I, I don't know what's the term, but uh, don't, don't be complacent. I think we need to make sure that we, we fulfill our mandatory obligations for the, under the Charity Act, do it, and then the people will, will, will come to you. The more transparent you are, the better the way you, you communicate the work that you are doing, especially when you're doing great work, then donors will come to you and they will support you. And when you carry out your work in a manner that is worthy of what a charity should be, then that will be your badge of honour that you carry and people will contribute. And then that includes explaining why you need to keep uh, a particular person in for 10 years more than what the code actually requires of you. I, I think the public will start to ask you this question. So start to think along those lines. We have not made it mandatory yet uh, for this round. I think we are still trying to get everyone on board to make sure you start to think along those lines and hopefully majority of you will start to do it. And, and like Kerry said, please don't aim for 80. Huh? Aim for 100% of your GEC score. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Right. So, yeah. Sao, you wanted to add something? Well, I think if the charity is relying heavily on one individual or even a small group, then I would really question the sustainability of the organization. Mm -hmm. And it would be considered a major risk if anything were to happen to this individual. Even if it's a group, there, there's probably camaraderie with, between the members of this group very tight. So if one leaves, maybe the, the others might want to leave as well. So I think that's a big risk. Um, I, we should all aim to groom existing board members 
as well as continually recruit new ones and give them varied leadership roles. The chair himself can move on to new roles in the charity or to other charities, you know, thereby benefiting the whole sector. The new code allows for extension in critical situations, but it will use that sparingly, perhaps during an emergency situation like in a pandemic or due to some unforeseen circumstances, there was a temporary succession vacuum. You know, so I, I wouldn't really um, depend on using this to keep your charity going forward. Thank you, Haoyao. And in fact, I, I believe if I look back at the vision hole, there are two questions related to compliance. Um, is there a limit to the number of board members that exceed 10 years if we have to? And, you know, if comply or explain, if I don't comply, uh, but can explain, does it mean I still get a score? Haoyao, what? Well, I suppose that would be comply. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, I think that the question was a small a group of individuals, how many, but as I mentioned, the larger the number, the, the higher the risk. Because if they do leave, then they, all do so, they may all do so at one time, right? And you're not really grooming your next generation of leaders. Yeah, thanks. Uh, in fact, uh, if charities have issues finding board members, no worries, we have CMPL that will be able to help you to find uh, the board members as well. Yeah. No, we, we now move on to this question uh, on the... Uh, uh, yes, Greg. sorry, Gregory, you have something to say. Gregory. Just a couple of quick ones, uh, you know, to, to add uh, to the, the wisdom of Commissioner, uh, as well as Hao Yao. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the danger is always from a psychological point of view as well, that if you're, if you're a long stayer, you might be an overstayer, you know, and, and that isn't welcome. And, you know, West Philip is, for example, a group that might dominate the discussion and, you know, prevent the infusion of fresh ideas. And so I think charities and IPCs need to think creatively, for example, if you want to have wisdom or expertise to tap into, can you think about, you know, for instance, an advisory role or in one group that I was part of where we didn't want to lose the wisdom and the expertise of the leaders. And so they were mentors. Of course, you know, they can't also become, uh, you know, shadow directors or in fact, directors of the board. There'll be other legal issues with that, but that could be a one way to preserve the link. Uh, so think creatively. And uh, you know, consider the spirit behind uh, you know this particular principle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, yeah, on on the same topic of succession planning as well, um, we often hear um, that to ensure that the board is effective, the chair also chairs its nominating committee. Um, this is to ensure that there's alignment on the board, and this is also ensure that um, you know the board can remain effective. How will you view this, hmm. Theresa? Okay, I have a personal experience uh, on this. Yeah, I was chairing a nomination committee and in the midst of it, I was asked to chair the board. Yeah, so I did quite a bit of research on this and I decided that if I was going to be the chair of the board, I would step down from the nominating committee. Uh, and the principle that drives this is independence. Yeah, and many of us are too confident that we can be objective and independent, but the field of behavioral science and organizational psychology has produced enough report to say that humans do have unconscious bias. And there was some research that dwells into the boardroom. And the research shows that directors actually do form unconscious bias in their sixth year of, of uh, service. And I wonder, you know, our public service, our state boards do have a term limit of six years. Yeah, and our listed companies have last year mandated a nine year term limit. And we charity being very generous, we're giving you a 10 year limit. Yeah, with lapses in between. So the question is, is there any compromise of conflicts of interest for charities? After all, there are no shareholders, right? We are all, you know, we don't own any assets in the charities that we serve. And to me, I will fall back on this unconscious bias, the theory and the research behind it, to say that either in the sixth, ninth or tenth year, there is a loss of independence. Yeah, which means if you're a chair, try not to be the NC chair. Yeah, and if you really have to, 
appoint an independent NC chair, independent meaning not the chair of the board, and the chair can be a member of that NC. Yeah? You only need three members to form a nominating committee. Right? And if you, the chair, is part of that committee, then make sure that the other two members are not having more than 10 years with the charities. Then you will have an NC that's totally biased and choosing members according to your own bias to further the organization. So while success looks eminent, public perception may not be so. Because your donors are now being trained to look for independence as well on the board. Yeah, and you don't want your donors or your, or your volunteers questioning your internal principles at all. That's my point of view. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, how yeah, I, I believe I agree one. with Teresa on the point of independence that uh, perhaps it's better that the chair of the board is not the chair of the nominating committee. I've been on boards that don't practice this. Uh, some practice former board members being members of the NC, and I think that quite works well. Um, but more importantly, the NC should play an active role in ensuring the board has the talents and experience in the key areas and to have sufficient diversity. They should meet actively. I think on many boards, NC, I, I observe, meet maybe once or at most twice a year, or whenever they, they feel they're, they just need to appoint a new member. But I think they, sh they should um, monitor, for example, the the term limit schedule, you know, because if your treasurer may be coming up for the four year term, your, your legal member on the board may be retiring a couple of years time. So they have to do planning as well. And you try to vet as many candidates as possible. And don't depend on just one person putting up one member and then the NC basically has not much of a choice to that, right? So I think the NC should be a lot more active. Yes, and on that note, I want to follow up uh, uh, because I always remember CNPL's uh, research on uh, director's uh, contribution. And the last research I remember was a 2020 research which zooms into succession planning and renewal for boards. And it was an all-time low of only 34% of charities having a succession plan. And out of this 34%, only 30% are actually working on their succession plan. Yeah, so there is a lot of uh, room for improvement for charities to renew yourself. Yeah? Yes. Thank you, Teresa. Commission, you want to add if I can, I can just add on to what Teresa said. I, I, I just, maybe I just share some practical points, observations I've seen. I, I've seen uh, quite a number of charities also do succession planning by what they call a principle of thirds. So for example, if they know that their board member, well, 10, 12 of them are there, they've been there for some time, and they're going to be there for 9, 10 years. So every term of three years, they will refresh their board, one third of their board, and they do it diligently. Right? It's painful, it's difficult, but once they start doing it, it becomes a lot easier. So that always one third of the board is new, Another third of the board is in the second year or second term that so they are already doing some great work and the third is a very experienced group. But any one time throughout that nine or ten year period, there's always a third that is relatively new, a third that is, that is uh, experienced and a, the other third that is really knows what's happening. And they do it diligently. And I think that is a very smart way to do it. A second observation of a large charity or rather a, a religious charity that I, I visited once, I, I it was a temple, and I met the chief abbot. And I asked the chief abbot, because he runs a, this temple runs millions of dollars of turnover and expenses. So I asked him, um, how, how do you keep track of the money? He said, his, his answer was really very interesting. He said, I, I'm a chief abbot. My expertise is in religious matters. All these issues of governance, I'm not very good at. So what do I do? I hire people and bring them on board who are very good at it. And lo and behold, on that board, there are lawyers, there are accountants, uh, who are more afraid of, of, uh, of, doing, uh, of taking money than it is of making, keeping a good account. So I realized this is a very wise abbot. He knows what he does not know. 
And because he does, he's worried about what he does not know, he brings in really good people to help run the, the governance aspect so that his charity does not ever get into trouble. I wish many of the charities, especially the religious groups, will take a leaf out of this abbot, what is, he has done. And that's why he's a, he's a clever man. And I told him so, and he laughed and he said, I only know spiritual matters. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Well, that's actually in terms of board diversity. Um, in the patient hall, there's a fair bit of questions um, regarding clarifications on the 10 years. Um, there are some questions to be asking, does stepping down after 10 years means leaving the board entirely or changing roles within the board? That means, could I be in the treasurer position for three years and I move on to a different position? And whether this 10 years also includes committees? Maybe Hao Yao, and then we hear from Gregory after Hao Yao. Well, I think clearly 10 years is on the board, whatever the board role is. So you can step off the board and you can chair some subcommittee. For example, it's always useful to chair, get the ex chair to chair a fundraising committee, for example. Right? And you can stay in the subcommittees, and, and I have done that as well. After I step off boards to stay in the subcommittees, you can stay engaged. And if after two years, you know, they think your services are still needed on the board, they invite you back. Um, I, I mean, I chaired an organization and, um, up, and after I retired, they didn't ask me back to chair again or be on the board again. So, so you know, sometimes you, you think you're indispensable, but actually you, know, <laughs> you, you are dispensable. Right. Gregory? Yeah, I, I agree, um, you know, with uh, Hao Yao's points as well. I mean, you know, uh, parting is, is sweet sorrow, and uh, you know, as I think uh, we, we all know, uh, uh, and uh, it, it's really about reflecting a clean break, uh, and that's really the, the spirit behind uh, this particular principle. So the question is whether there are other roles, um, you know, advisory board, for example, um, mentor, or you know, someone someone with distinguished service could it, could it be an emeritus role, uh, fundraising project, as how you mentioned, perhaps a, a book writing project and, and you could find ways uh, to engage meaningfully, but the spirit behind this is clean break. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Yeah, I like the part that you mentioned about the spirit of the code. And in fact, in principle three, that, you know, we talk about the charity acts responsibly, fairly, and with integrity. And there is actually a special mention of a code of conduct that reflects the charity's values and standards of ethics. Well, must charities have a code of conduct, and why is this necessary? Gregory, since we have you online. Sure. Uh, happy to share some thoughts to kickstart the answer to this. Um, it is, in my view, um, a, valuable, a valuable exercise uh, for a charity board to crystallize um, its ethos uh, in writing, uh, which captures both you know, the fundamental ethics as well as values uh, that the charity considers to be important. And, um, you know, this is you know, obviously a case of trying to find uh, time as well to get into this aspect. And uh, for, you know, a number of uh, startup charities or, you know, maybe charities that are on an earlier part of the, the, the organizational life cycle, there may be other priorities. We'll be doing a lot of downstream work and um, you're too busy fighting fires. Uh, but I would especially encourage, um, you know, our, our mature boards, our progressing boards to capture uh, this aspect of uh, the ethos in writing. Now, why is that important? Because, um, you know, integrity is um, very much the foundation of a charity. And uh, we all have a duty to act honestly. We are fiduciaries as uh, charity trustees. We need to do the right thing in the right way at the right time. And so embedding that, you know, actually gives... Um, uh, a memorial uh, which could guide future boards, guide you know future uh, leaders as well. But what is important, but more than a piece of paper, it is really about trying to create a culture. Uh, and that's really what you want to do. How do you um, undergird uh, you know, the, the programs and services and the way in which uh, you fulfill your mission, carry your objectives with an undergirding of this ethos, this code of conduct? So it is, to me, an important document in addressing the how question. How should you carry out uh, your, your activities uh, as a charity? 
And, um, and linked to that is, of course, questions such as fair practices uh, that apply to the charity. So, you know, this, this issue of ethos is oftentimes neglected. We focus a lot on mission and vision, but you could use uh, the, the time frame in a retreat uh, or in a special board meeting to get into a discussion about what is really important. Uh, for example, there may be, you know, a charity that is working with children that come from homes where there's been uh, alcohol abuse and they may want to take a stand about, uh, you know, not receiving funding uh, from uh, uh, liquor companies. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, there's a lot of good funding that comes from that. But it's just that for that charity, that is an important part of its ethos and it may want to make its own stand. Uh, but you, you can only do that if you've had a time to reflect and to introspect and consider what is truly important on the how question. Thank you. Now, in response to one of the questions from Pigeon Ho as well, uh, um, how to conduct checks for bots? Background checks on bots, board members, the, the, this requirement uh, from Pigeon Ho. How to conduct background check for bots? Maybe, Hao Yao, you like to, <laughs> since you are the chair for the sub, well, board subcommittee. Course, uh, <laughs> the, the first thing is, remember Google is your friend, right? Yeah. <laughs> but of course, aside from that, you know, of course there's references, you know, you can <coughs> check back where the person has uh, also been a director of, is um, references from work or, or other kind of contacts. I mean, that's, that's always a, a way to, to go by. Yeah, that's how I, I, I would do it. Yeah. Aside from maybe some formal checks that uh, yeah. the commissioner may have, <laughs> have some <laughs> suggestions for. That's a national secret. <laughs> as long as they're not the bad, right? <laughs> okay. Well, well, the the, the I, I once worked for a very wise uh, chairman, and uh, he, he he was the chair of the stat board that we used to work in. Uh, and I'm I'm forever having lunches with him and the and some stranger that he has called up for lunch. After working with him for for some time, we realized actually he's he's recruiting people for the for the board. And his method is a, is a very simple method. He'll, he'll pull up, he hears about it, like through Hao Yao, he finds, he Googles a chat, he finds, he thinks that a person can serve an audit committee or a risk, risk committee and so on and so forth. He will invite the person out for lunch, we have lunch, we talk about it, then he gauges the chap's interest. He will bring the person in, if the guy is interested or the lady is interested, into a small role first. He sets up a committee, he looks at he gets the person to be a member or to chair that committee. He introduces the person to the, to the mission and the vision of the, of the stat board. And then he has his time to assess the person. Mm. Some, he will drop out after the committee is disbanded. But quite a few end up becoming a board member. So subsequently, after one or two years, that person becomes a board, board member. And remember, I mentioned earlier, we have a, 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 one, a principle of one third. He'll change the board. Every one third, he'll change it. And so we always have, or rather he always has on his board, uh, a, a group of very uh, good people who have been tested and he is confident in, and they know what they're coming in for. Thanks. Sorry, please don't just... Yeah. Yeah, when I checked the NC uh, committee, uh, I was quite robust in checking uh, on the background uh, of the board members. Um, besides doing the bankruptcy and credit checks, which many um, headhunters do. Um, the other thing I did was do reference checks. Yeah, and in our mind, how can you do this for board members? Yeah? But my experience is the board members do understand why I need to do three reference checks. I never, I never had any pushback from the board members when I asked them, name me three references. Yeah? And uh, this should preferably not be friends. And they were okay with releasing the names and you know, as a result of the reference checks, I got even more potential board members. Yeah, so, so do not, do not uh, subject to your own assumptions that this is not possible. Now, one of the hardest things I find that that's needs a bit of discernment would be intention. Yeah, of course, the board member will tell you they, are, they, are, they want to serve on the board for the right reasons. How do you uncover that intention? That's something you ask the references, right? The other thing is time. Many board members are very busy and they travel most of the time. Are they going to be contributing productively to the board? That's another thing that you want to be very uh, concerned about. Yeah. And 
in order for the board to match the dynamics of the other board members. It is important to focus on the soft skills as well, not just the competencies, which we often do, but also the soft skills, yeah, so that you can have healthy board dynamics and board debates in order to make robust decisions. So do not underestimate the, the power of checking on your board members. Thank you. Um, there, there's this question in terms of ESG in pigeonhole as well. And um, you know, on the topic of ESG, how can charities develop policies to address and assess its impact and to what extent? And what should charities actually report? Wait, Commissioner Hao Yao, maybe over to you. Well, just, just a quick uh, one to start off. You know, in the corporate world, ESG is, can be a daunting topic. With global reporting initiative standards, task force on climate-related financial disclosures, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and others. However, I think for charities for this moment, it will be useful to start by taking cue from the national initiative, the Singapore Green Plan 2030, which refers to items like alternate energies, uh, solar, reduction of waste, pollutants, carbon emissions, water usage, and electric vehicles. Could be a reduction in use of plastics, recy recycling efforts, energy saving equipment like lights and air cons. I mean, I think this is a, a good way to start. Because I would expect stakeholders to be paying more attention to the environment and sustainability and to eventually impose sustainability disclosures and standards before tying up with the organization or awarding contracts. So starting off, I think at the board level, you know, identify your own specific ESG areas, prioritize them based on what you feel has the highest level of impact on your organization. You know, on the E, just for some suggestions, could be energy emissions, water waste management. On the S, the health and safety, training and development, customer satisfaction. You may also want to look at some targets. For example, reducing water and energy usage by 10% over the next one or two years. You know, something for the board to start thinking about. Right. Commissioner, anything to add on from there? Oh, just, just a background for those who didn't attend last year when we were having the focus group discussion. So when we were thinking of putting in this as part of the code, I think there was a, a lot of, uh, we created quite a alarm or buzz. So everybody was very anxious about this environmental uh, aspect of, uh, of ESG, and so they, were, they, they, they asked many, many questions. I, I think just to set the record straight, we, we heard all of these this anxieties, and we're only introducing this as, a, as, as an introduction to the idea of, of environmental requirements when you run your charity. I will not belabor the point, how y'all has already mentioned it. So, so we need to start to think along these lines. Uh, a cue will be what the government will be doing with all the businesses, and we don't want to be too far behind that curve. So for now, it's an introduction, look at it, see what you can do in, in ways that Hao has suggested. Um, and even in my own ministry, I, I came one day and, my, and I realized that the dustbin by my table has disappeared. <laughs> uh, now I have to walk about 50 meters to a central dustbin, uh, the central bin to put my stuff. Another day I came and said, where are all the cups? You know, they give you, they, give, they say bring your own cup. So now, now I have to carry my own cup, to throw my own rubbish. There's no more waste paper basket in the room. You get used to it, no? you get used to it. So take the small steps first mm. uh, and then so that you will not be caught flat-footed when things happen subsequently. Mm. It's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen. So take your baby steps first. Mm. Okay? Yeah. So for small steps uh, for the environment, yes, I agree. But we are the S of the ESG, right? Yeah. So we have no excuses to, to say, let's wait for other sectors to lead the way because we have to be role modeling that. And what does the S mean? Definitely, whatever we do is for the social good. Whatever we do is for the health, to build trust among the stakeholders. And there's this uh, trend that's moving in the business world, it's called integrated reporting. Yeah, more and more investors want to know how companies are actually stringing all their different functions uh, and work practices and stakeholders together. So, so, so it makes sense, yeah? And uh, the integrated reporting states that there are seven types of stakeholders that all 
businesses should be looking into, and that applies to charities as well. And who are the stakeholders? Customers, of course, that's our beneficiaries. Employees, how well are we taking care of them? Donors, in our case, volunteers. Um, Commissioner, or, or how you mentioned earlier, are, are we just using our volunteers for practical purposes? Or do we see them as part of our workforce that's embedded and integrated into the work we do? Now, another set would be our partners. Yeah? As, as you get into more and more collaborative work, other charities are your partners as well. Yeah, how true are you to them uh, in the sense that you're competing sometimes, but how are you working towards the collaborative outcome? Another set of uh, stakeholders are regulators. Yeah, responsibility to regulators. And the last set would be the communities that you serve. Right? So to me, this gives a very good a guideline on which are the seven sets of stakeholders that we should be really focusing on um, to ensure that's fair practice and also well-being um, and mutual, mutual uh, synergism in achieving whatever we are planning to achieve. But Teresa, since you mentioned on stakeholders and the seven types of stakeholders, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in principle six, we, we did mention that the charity communicates actively mm. to the public confidence. Mm. Now, on this same topic of branding, stakeholder engagement, and media comms policy, now most of our smaller charities do not actually have a comms team. In your view, why is this vital and how can we go about this? Yeah, I have a lot of empathy for the small charities um, because they are trying to do big things with very little resources. And sometimes they ended up being Singapore's best kept secret, right? So how can, what can we do to help these charities? Firstly, the charities must recognize that you must communicate your, your mission, your vision, your strategy to, to as many stakeholders as you can um, and, and use uh, effective ways of communicating. When we were talking about um, how can we help the small charities, we were thinking there's a possibility that we should seriously look at setting up a shared service uh, to, help uh, to help charities evolve your communication strategy. Now, your communication strategy only makes sense if you have a clear mission strategy. So that could go into helping you to craft mission strategy as well, followed by a communication strategy. And then, which are the segments that you want to communicate to? What is the narrative behind that? And what are the communication tools that you could be um, looking out for in your implementation of that strategy? Yeah, so akan datang, give us some time. We do recognize that this is something very important for the smaller charities. And I'm saying this assuming that the large charities are already doing this effectively. <laughs> well, that's an assumption. Well, <laughs> Gregory, yes, I know you have something to comment on this. Uh, yes, very glad to um, you know, echo what uh, Teresa has uh, shared with us all. And uh, in this is, I think, very important because um, you know, sometimes you know, out of sight is, is out of mind. And, and uh, you know, so you have to pay attention to you know, this aspect of, you know, how are you, you know, engaging, uh, you know, with uh, the, the media, with, you know, your external stakeholders and, um, you know, with the, with the broader uh, public as well. The important point I also want to emphasize is that we need to look at this from the perspective of a risk management lens. And the specific risk that I'm referring to is reputation risk management as well. I think with, with the proliferation of, you know, social media, and uh, you know, trying to manage not only your conventional media but also social media and and the perceptions about your charity and the standards with which um, you know the, the general public expect um, the charities to conduct themselves. It is important to get wise advice. Um, and Teresa's already shared uh, you know some uh, practical examples. Uh, if you can get it, you know, pro bono, uh, low bono, uh, you know, or you know, perhaps even a board member who's paying particular attention to this side of the house. Uh, helping to oversee it. And one of the charities that I serve on, both the deputy chair and myself, you know, oversee all the media uh, releases that go out. And so, you know, that 
that is critical because you really want to make sure that the messaging is accurate, it's balanced, and it's also sensitive, uh, not only to your own beneficiaries, but to the broader community that we are living in, a multiracial, multireligious, uh, multi-demographical one as well. And, um, and so, you know, one can talk a lot about areas such as branding, I won't go there, but you need to, need to figure that piece out uh, valuably as well, because it's linked to transparency and accountability, which is also seen in uh, principle um, five. Thank you so much, Greg. Oh, Ma maybe this I one... could add on to yes. Greg and Teresa. Um, you know, aside from reaching out to donors and beneficiaries, the public, uh, particularly you want to reach out to the younger uh, public as well, right? Of uh, course, you want to bring them on board and, and um, reach out to them early. But branding and communication is also important to attract volunteers, board members. I mean, earlier we talked about that. And I think a lot of it is you, you want to be a good marriage partner as well. You know? So tidy up the place, meet in yourself, present yourself well. Right? And, and that's, that's why we cannot leave out branding and communications. Right. Thank you, Hao Yao. Um, this question that pop up um, and it's really about plans to introduce annual mandatory continuing professional development hours on charity governance and management centric for board members and senior management. Maybe Commissioner like to address on this. Are there plans to introduce annual mandatory CPD hours? Is I think that a question a or a suggestion? <laughs> <laughs> If, if I know Theresa, the answer will be, yeah. will be yes. Okay? Yes, that's I dream yes. about that all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, I, I don't think it's going to be mandatory at this point in time. Huh? But I will not be able to, to say whether or not it will not be mandatory in, in time to come. If the situation, and a few, a few factors can, can cause this to happen. If let's say there is really, uh, the charity sector is run so poorly, that the confidence of the public is really at all time low, then this is Singapore, no? When, when things like that happen, all sorts of uh, legislative actions will have to be taken and then, and then you'll finally find that you may end up being mandatory. Or if we think that we are in a stage where we are mature enough and that we are ready for it, then it can be so. I just saw a question there about anti-money laundering and terrorism financing. I thought I'd just do a quick point on it. This problem has not uh, come to the charity sector yet. But we know that in countries overseas, terrorism financing uh, and anti-money laundering uh, money has gone through charity quite commonly in certain countries. So we are careful uh, and we are grateful that this has not come to our shores. But I will not rule out the possibility of it happening one day. So we need to prepare for that. And this is particularly for those charities who are doing work with overseas countries, or you're handling large monies that go out to Singapore to partner agencies in other countries. So somebody asks, how, I'm a small charity, how do I deal with it? It's very onerous. Look, if, you are, you, if your charity is set up to do work overseas, then it is uh, wise, it will be wise of you to make sure that you know where, number one, where your money comes from. Number two, where your money is going to go to. Number three, who are you working with over the other side? So that the money that donors have given you is put to the correct use and not end up in some terrorist camp. So, so this is important. If you are not sure where your money came from, then please go and make a STR report, huh? some, some suspicious, suspicious transaction report, and then we can follow up from there. If you are not sure that your partner is trustworthy, then for goodness sake, don't, don't go and work with that partner. Go and work with other agencies that, that are familiar with the overseas work like Red Cross or RLAF and so on and so forth. Then you have some assurance that, that you don't get into unnecessary trouble. You bring your entire charity into disrepute and then nobody is going to support you anymore because of this one incident that happens. I hope this does not happen, but we need to prepare for that to come. You may ask, Hey, how do I set up an AML or TF policy? Well, there are templates. There are other agencies that have already set it up. You can find some of these templates around. But please, when you fill up a template, do not fill it up blindly. You need to understand what the questions are that is, that is contextualized 
for your charity and then to love the temple. Okay, please. Thanks. Uh, oh, yes. I, I want to say something about whether training should be mandatory or not um, and share with you some of my thoughts regarding what's important for us as the charity council to do. We have started to look into data mining um, based on whatever data is available and also data that is around but not organized. Yeah, we're data mining all that. So we have a more granular understanding of what the sector is about. Um, I am particularly interested in the charities. Where are you? Are, are, are you in the startup stage, in the growth stage, matured stage, or in the declining stage? Because at different stages, you would have different needs. Yeah, and I mentioned earlier on about consolidating, aligning, streamlining, whatever enablers we have now, are not just training and development, but tools and frameworks, shared services, partners, technology, assist, uh, volunteer uh, support, consolidate all this and, you know, make the, bring the relevant essentials to the different stages of the life cycle. And to me, when we arrive at that point, then we will decide, should we mandate it or not? Yeah, and, and this is gonna take a while. In the meantime, like commissioners say, it's not mandatory, but definitely strongly, strongly encouraged. Right, thank you. So, it, sorry, I, I, need to, I need to add something to what Teresa said. <laughs> yes. And, and please forgive me, I, I'm not trying to threaten anybody, but I need to remind everybody that under the Charity Act, the, the, the fiduciary duty of all board members are very clear, right? So it's, it's stated there. And the penalties are heavy, okay? It's, it's, it's $10,000 fine, three years jail, or both. So if you are in a charity and you are a director of a charity on the board, or you're the chairman of charity, I, I think the, the prudent thing to do if I'm the chairman, if you are the chairman, is to go and look at every one of your board members and ask yourself, do they know what their fiduciary duties are? Do they require any training? Because if you don't take the trouble to do that and they get into trouble, this is the entire board that gets into trouble. They will drag you down with them because, because we will have to go in and we have to investigate and in investigating, we'll find out who is, who's culpable and who's not. So the common sense thing to do then uh, for any board uh, in a charity is to make sure that all the members, you look out for each other and those you know are, are not very well equipped in certain areas, go and get yourself equipped because there are all sorts of funding that's available. It's a matter of time and commitment. And then you will sleep better at night and then you don't have the, the, the COC's office uh, on your back. You, know? you can get him off your back and you can go and do the work that you are doing well. All right? Thank you, Commissioner. We heard you loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this brings us back to a very interesting question. Most of the time, uh, we know we talk about risk and risk is often passed down to management. And, and rightfully, you mentioned that it's also the role of the board. So maybe, how you know, you've been very much involved in this area. When it comes to the identification and the review of risk, how much should the board be involved? Well, definitely. I mean, I think a lot of the board's time should be to think about risk, and, and not only during board meetings, I think even you know, throughout, throughout the year. You know, but we should also specify certain time during the board meetings to keep abreast of the organizational operation, financial compliance risk. There are also a lot of other risks now, you know, there's pandemic risk, there's geopolitical risk, there's trade restrictions, sanctions, any of these could disrupt operations, fundraising, disruption of supplies, uh, even staff issues, you know, and of course now there's cyber risk, there's risk of breaching PDPA and others. So definitely it's going to require board's attention and, and don't, don't put it on one side and look only at operational matters. I think you should spend quite a bit of time on risk as well. Thank you. Gregory, you have something to add on from there? Uh, yes, just to add that, uh, you know, principle 2.3 um, of, the, of the new um, code um, also requires that, you know, the board should have committees to, or designated board members to oversee the following areas where relevant to the charity and, and that includes um, audit uh, and finance. So some aspects of uh, risk could also be managed, uh, you know, sensibly 
by committees. Now, that doesn't mean that the board is delegating, you know, uh, without uh, or abdicating its responsibility. Uh, but, you know, it's just kind of having the specialized teams to analyze different facets of uh, the, the enterprise risk involved. And, you know, some charities keep risk registers uh, and, and those are reviewed, you know, on a periodic basis as well. Uh, the point is that, you know, this is an important part of um, a modern charity, uh, a 21st century uh, charity to pay attention to different types of risks that, uh, you know, could be applicable to the charity. And that's part of prudent, uh, you know, stewardship uh, as a charity trustee. Right. Thank you. And you mentioned about being prudent as well. And we want to very quickly move on this topic of the charity being um, accountable and transparent, which is actually brings us to principle five. Now, on the topic of the uh, board evaluation, um, is it necessary to conduct board assessments since we already submitted the GEC checklist on an annual basis? Well, I think the GEC is more for governance evaluation. The board evaluation usually talks more about you know, board members understanding the mission and vision and that they have the tools uh, to be prepared for meetings, perhaps even to evaluate each other's performance as board members. Um, this should be done each year, and then you can observe the trends and spot the issues. It's very different from the GEC. I want to come from the angle of a, a clear and basic understanding of what corporate governance means, right? It means you have a good balance of conformance and performance. In fact, ideally, you should have a high level of conformance and a high level of performance. That will make you an effective board. Now, the checklist satisfy the conformance part. Yeah, we've given you all the principles and the prescription for you to say, comply or explain. That's really looking from a conformance angle. To what extent has my charity conformed to the code of governance? Now, it doesn't measure the performance of your board. Right, the problem, uh, how effective your board is, how it cascades down to the executive and the workforce. The guideline has no way of, the, the checklist has no way of doing that. Yeah, so to satisfy, you need to fulfill the GEC checklist, which is conformance to the code. And then you need to do your board evaluation or any other practices that you do to ensure that your board is effective. Because when your board is effective, it means your charity is performing. Yeah, so we're really going back to basic understanding here, right? And there's a question that asks, do we need the board to approve the GEC before submission? Definitely, because your board is the highest level of decision-making and the fiduciary duty sits in, in their laps and their entire being. So if the GEC checklist goes to commissioner office without the board being aware, it means you have, on behalf of them, carried their fiduciary duty. Yeah, and if anything goes wrong, who is going to be accountable for that? Your board member, yes, but they can say that, well, I didn't approve of this. So board members do not compromise on this. We have made a statement in the code very, very clearly that the GEC must be approved by the board members. So make it a point. And do not keep it until the end of the year to do it. Yeah, it should be something that you do on a quarterly basis, as much as possible. How are we doing on this checklist? Yeah, by the time you have the annual report submission and all that, it's a breeze because you've already discussed it during the year. Yeah? Well, uh, yes, Gregory. Yeah, just uh, two quick points. I think um, a useful resource is the National Council of Social Services Organizational Health Framework for Social Services, which is a self-assessment toolkit. But again, you know, as uh, how y'all has, um, you know, very sharply distinguished, there's a difference between the organizational evaluation and, uh, and, and that is what the GEC uh, relates to and the board evaluation. And so one practical way to achieve the board evaluation is to ask um, individual board members to do a self-evaluation uh, that could be submitted to the chair uh, and the deputy chair to, you know, sort of review and consider and maybe even the findings could be worked on whether in a retreat setting or outside that in terms of training. Right, thank you, Gregory. Well, the, this uh, question as well on whether the GEC scores will be made public, this in the pigeon hole. Commissioner. The GEC scores are public because when you put it up, 
the, the public will have a look at it. And I would really, really urge you to do make it public because those of you who really practice what, what good governance is about, the chances are if, if you really are uh, uh, working diligently at it, your G scores will be pretty good. When you put it up on it and eventually when sponsors, donors, grant makers look at it, it gives them a measure of confidence that they, uh, in your charity that they want to do work with and partner with. Right, thank you. I'm very cautious of time as well. And uh, we actually have to bring this session to a close. But uh, before we end, perhaps I'd like to invite uh, each of our panelists um, to share with all of us here a key takeaway from this, uh, in case they cannot remember what we have discussed in the past hour. Yeah, maybe we begin with uh, Ao Yang. Well, I would just say that, you know, charity should try to go beyond the code and the GEC. You know, that's just like a base for all charities. The board can decide to go to the next level to better future-proof your organization. Thank you. Mayor Gregory? Yeah, um, yes, I mean, I think, I think we've heard a, a lot of wisdom, uh, you know, in the course of the presentation on, uh, you know, the, the revised code and also in terms of, you know, this particular session. And um, I would just emphasize a point that we probably haven't emphasized in this uh, setting, and that is principle five uh, of the new code, which is the, the charity is accountable and transparent. Uh, so I think those are, those are you know, not just uh, nice sounding words, but those are core to stewardship of a charity, accountability and transparency. Thank you, Gregory. Um, Teresa? I would like uh, to encourage you all to take ownership of uh, the development of corporate governance, uh, both personally and organizationally. Um, I also would like you all to support us in achieving 100% of submission of the GEC, right? Uh, An increase in participation in the Charity Transparency Award and the Charity Governance Award. And of course, as high a participation as possible in all the organized events together with our partners who are all sitting in the front row. We've all put a lot of effort in it. We are given it pro bono as much as we can and not compromising the quality. Yeah. So do let's challenge each other, but we must support each other as well. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Commissioner. Yeah. The, the charity sector and, and all of you guys who are in it play a very, very important part of, of our society. And, and I think this is the, the beautiful part of Singapore because people who are concerned step up and do the work that benefits many of our own Singaporeans and, and people who live here. So you should continue to do the good work. Now, in case you feel a little bit overwhelmed by all the things that have been said, uh, believe me, when you sit down and you look at the, at the revised code, it, is, it, is, it has been simplified and it's not as as frightening as it may seem or it may sound. But take a look at it. We are running training courses with uh, various APEX organizations. I believe next week we are going to meet with the temples and then, then with the churches and so on and so forth. So if you have any queries, you're not very sure what to do, just give us a call and we'll be more than happy to help you. But it's important that you start to prioritize in the areas that you feel are important for your charity. I don't think you can do everything at a go, there are some things you are probably already doing that's good. The parts that you may want to show up, prioritize them, take them one step at a time. Not very sure, give us a call. We'll, your sector administrators and, and charity unit will be more than happy to, to help you on that. Okay? Thank you so much, Commissioner. Well, fellow leaders, we must bring our panel discussion now to a close. Uh, while we attempt to answer all questions live, I do sincerely apologize if your question has not been answered. But not to worry, uh, because our colleagues from Charities Unit will be noting these questions that you have brought up in this session, and we will subsequently be uh, circulating the FAQ uh, based on the common T's being raised. We also hope you find our event in conversation with Commissioner of Charities and Charity Council 2023 useful. Um, for our audience present, do scan the QR code on the projector screen to assess the survey. And for all of uh, our audience uh, joining us through Zoom, your feedback will help us to make future events more relevant and useful to you. So once the event feed ends, you'll receive the survey on your browser, and we do appreciate if you could help us share your feedback. And for the audience 
present, once again, do scan the QR code on the projector screen and we hope to have your feedback. Once again, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner, Madam Chair, Mr. Ang, Mr. Gregory, for spending time with us this morning. And now I believe it's afternoon and um, you know, for your invaluable insights. So once again, um, for all charities, we are here for you. So in case you need any legal advice, please um, contact Pro Bono SG, Board Advisory Services, CNPR is here, as well as all the shared services partner of the Charities Unit. We are all here for you. So with that, on behalf of the Office of the Commission of Charities, the Charity Council, Pro Bono SG, and the Centre for Nonprofit Leadership, MVPC, thank you everyone for joining us this morning.